Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Boss, and this is a breakdown of 2003's X2 X-Men United. This is the second installment of our X-Men Stick Stick Rewatch, as we break down all 13 of the Fox X-Men and Deadpool films ahead of Wolverine's Mutant Homecoming and Deadpool 3 in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. In this terrifying election year, X2 reminds us how politically charged Marvel mutant stories can get. So let's spend some time with pre-Logan Roy Brian Cox and break down all the new Easter eggs, things you never spotted, and which elements Kevin Feige will bring back in Deadpool 3, including the fact that this film technically has a very first Deadpool cameo. But if you want to avoid any Deadpool 3 spoilers, don't worry, I'm going to leave any kind of spoiler conversation for the danger room at the end of this video. And to celebrate this X-Men Stick Stick Rewatch, we are doing a special X-Men themed merch release, which is really the best way to support us at New Rock Stars. Grab one of these designs by clicking in the link in the description. Okay, so during the 20th Century Fox fanfare and logo, the X once again lingers like it did in the first film. This is the first X film, though, in the series to use the Marvel comic book logo. We would see this in front of other Marvel films in the aughts, including the Sony Spider-Man films, Daredevil, Punisher, Ghost Rider, Fantastic Four, and the first few films produced by Marvel Studios in partnership with other studios like Paramount and Universal. Yep, when Kevin Feige now says all Marvel branded titles produced by other studios can come back via the multiverse, that also includes Nick Cage Ghost Rider peeing fire and Ray Stevenson Punisher from 2008 Punisher Warzone shotgunning a guy's face off. Once again, we open on Patrick Stewart narrating as Charles Xavier. Um, mutants the next link in the evolutionary chain or simply a new species of humanity. On the words, a new species, a green star appears out of nowhere within this red tinted nebula in space, forming into a humanoid figure, which must be the Phoenix Force, the deeper power within Jean Grey, who emerges in this film. A bald silhouette in space, though? Not unlike the imagery Marvel Studios would borrow for the Watcher in the What If series. Charles wonders whether mutants are just what humans evolve into or a fully different species. The answer to that question will inform how well these tribes will share the planet because, as Charles says, sharing the world has never been humanity's defining attribute. We push into that green star in the Phoenix Force's brain to enter the nerve synapses under the opening titles. In last week's breakdown, I described how this was meant to show Cerebro, what Charles sees when he meditates behind that locked door. This time, the brain tissue is merged with techie plating and wiring to reflect how Cerebro's machinery fuses with Charles's mind, a process that gets hijacked in this movie. Remember, these early X-Men movies were coming out when the predominant cultural force in American sci-fi cinema was the Matrix films, where moody brain meets machine cyberpunk was really all the rage. In the previous movie, the locked X door of Cerebro opened to Auschwitz. This time, it opens to the emblem of the White House, as we find ourselves on a tour, peering over the shoulders of tourists, looking at this sign from the gaze of this mystery man in sunglasses. We will soon learn Alan Cumming as Kurt Wagner, Nightcrawler. The tour guide quotes Abraham Lincoln. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break the bonds of our affection. This is actually a cameo by Jubilee voice actor from X-Men Evolution, Kiara Zani. Hey guys, check this out. Alan Cumming in 2003 was best known as a stage actor, much like Hugh Jackman was before he was cast. Cumming had won awards for playing the MC in a revival of Cabaret, and also small roles in GoldenEye and Eyes Wide Shut. The actor speaks fluent German, and he shares a birthday with Mozart, whose Dies Irae from Requiem in D minor plays during the hallway fight with the Secret Service agents. Now, Beast, Angel, and Gambit were all considered as new characters for this film, but they ultimately settled on Nightcrawler instead, since he felt like the most outsidery option. Before we see Nightcrawler teleporting, we just hear this great sound effect. So in the comics, Wolverine's claws go snicked and Nightcrawler goes bamf. Technically, when Nightcrawler teleports, though, he transfers through what's known as the brimstone dimension, which is why he comes out smelling like sulfur and why in this movie, he's surrounded by smoke whenever this happens. He bamps to the portrait of JFK. This is while President McKenna is addressing Jackie, his secretary, Jackie, who shares the first name with JFK's first lady. McKenna is played by actor Cotter Smith and is original to X2, but Smith had played Robert Kennedy in a 1983 TV movie, and he's signing a document that reads President's Eyes Only. In addition to JFK and Lincoln, there is also a portrait of William McKinley. So all three of these presidents were assassinated in office and we're just reminded that no president is safe. Senator Kelly warned that this would happen in the last film. A girl in Illinois who can walk through walls. Now what's to stop her from walking into a bank vault? 
or into the White House. Super attacks on the White House is a nightmare scenario that we saw with General Zod in Superman 2, and I am terrified to see what the boys does with this kind of thing. This Oval Office set is an exact recreation, but the hallways were made wider to allow more room for fighting. This sequence smartly orients us from the vantage points of the confused Secret Service agents with frantic pans and cuts, and rarely stays too long with Kurt. And I love this shot that dollies rightward through the wall on Nightcrawler kicking the agent through the glass. It's an impossible glide, but it matches the way Kurt is kind of impossibly teleporting through this doorway to tackle the agent on the other side. He always needs to break a threshold in order to go through it first, kind of like a vampire needing an invitation to go through the other side, because he cannot teleport through a wall that he can't see the other side of. Now, it all happens so fast, the agents can't even verify how many attackers there are, and adding to the confusion is the fact that Nightcrawler can use his tail as a fifth appendage to grab and toss guns, and fight two agents at once. His bamps leave these ribbon wisps of smoke, a trail of confusion as the Secret Service doesn't know what is smoke and what is flesh. They lock down the oval and the camera swoops through the peephole, a kind of David Fincher type shot here, to the office outside, and the camera whip pans with increasing disorientation, but I love this peephole shot because it tells us how close Nightcrawler is getting to them, and as he gets closer, the edit shows more and more of his acrobatics. An overhead shot showing his sweeping the leg of another agent, whipping another at the same time, and teleporting to the side of another agent to tackle him into that doorway of that outer office that the peephole shot just established. And this guy says, don't shoot, and his eyes direct them upward to the corner where ah, Kurt has suspended himself with his tail and looks like he is floating. A true horror Freddy Krueger type jump scare for these guys. DSE Ray brings an extra level of terror because it is historically a funeral composition, originally a Gregorian chant dated back to the 13th century, and it's part of a poem describing the last judgment of souls in front of God, which is a hint of Nightcrawler's religious affinity, his belief that he is a creature of evil who needs to be judged by God. But the music cuts out right as the guards start firing at the spot Nightcrawler was seconds before, just in time for us to experience the terrifying muffled sounds that the president hears outside of its door. At one point, they hear sounds above them, kind of like in a horror movie. And then the door opens, and then one agent gets snatched into the abyss, and it's like we're in the middle of a storm or a smoke bomb has been exploded. The music returns, and now finally do we see each of Nightcrawler's beautiful moves in slow motion as President McKenna is being held down by his agents because he is able to see it all go down, kind of like feeling like his life is slowing down at the moment of his death. Kurt pins the president, and we focus on his sharp teeth, his eyes. He lifts the dagger, but one agent fires and clips his arm, and Kurt lets out an animal-like yelp. <laughs> It's a good thing the agent waited to shoot until after the dagger moved from one side of his body to the other, because Kurt drops it the moment he teleports directly beneath him, and this time it's inches to the side of McKenna's belly. Now this ribbon reads, Mutant Freedom Now. Now, if we were thinking about this, which we shouldn't be thinking about, this moment happened so fast. If a mutant were powerful enough to kill the president, why would they take credit for it this way? Who would this message even be for? The vice president who would have a tougher time passing any mutant rights legislation after this as a result? Clearly, this is a false flag orchestrated by someone who wants to use it as a predicate to move against mutants, as we'll learn later. It's William Stryker. But this movie begins in such a state of excitement and fear that it doesn't give us time to think. We begin this movie as disoriented as any mutant-fearing human would be. Okay, onto the snowy Canadian mountains. Wolverine gets a wide view of the hydroelectric dam, foreshadowing the uneven water levels that will later lead to Jean's drowning. He follows this wolf to the Alkali Lake Industrial Complex, but gets no answers as we cross-dissolve to a stuffed wolf and as Storm gives a lecture to her students. Neanderthals, we once believed that they were wiped out by years of conflict with a much more advanced branch of humanity called Cro-Magnon Man. So Storm goes on to say that recent research suggested that the two species may have interbred, evolving into modern humans. So remember that deleted scene from the first film showed Storm lecturing about Roman Emperor Constantine's conversion to Christianity. Now she lectures about how two stages of evolution of a single species can still coexist. Halle Berry dropped the Kenyan accent for the sequel, and her role was beefed up after winning the Oscar for Monsters Ball. According to Alan Cumming, he joined Halle Berry, Hugh Jackman, Patrick Stewart, James Marsden, and Famke Jansen in full costume, confronting director Brian Singer in his trailer over his his reported abuse of painkillers, temper tantrums on set, his propensity to just disappear from set for long periods. Singer reportedly responded by saying, you people are full of 
shit. And Halle Berry reportedly said, I've heard enough, you can kiss my black ass. So yes, this is a great movie. It just probably wasn't a very fun one for them to make. The young mutant already sticks out his forked tongue to this human girl. He will call this back in the final scene with Stryker. Among the mutant students is a girl with a fringe jacket. This was supposed to be Danielle Moonstar, aka Mirage. There was an extended version of this museum scene in which we would have seen Kia Wong lighting up her fingers with electricity as this movie's jubilee. She actually shows up in the final scene in Charles Xavier's office. One student checks out the skeleton of a Sabretooth, a nod to the character Sabretooth. Tyler Maine and Ray Park were supposed to return for X2 as Sabretooth and Toad, but apparently there were some scheduling conflicts and the script was already pretty packed with mutants as it was. But now, ever since Liberty Island, Jean Grey's telepathy has been far more powerful and she hears all the voices around her. Makes me insane when she does this. Do it, do it, do it. Hands. Hands. I love the sound mix here because three of those voices were audio clips from different parts of the movie. To the shelter was the Secret Service agent. To the shelter. To the shelter. No, was Logan's voice later on. No, no. And they're gonna kill him was Rogue later on. They're gonna kill him. They're gonna kill him. So the Phoenix Force is allowing Jean to hear voices from the future. She is detached from time. I theorized last week that Phoenix is not bound by time and she was able to connect with Logan presently for him in the Weapon X lab in the 1980s. Again, we will see in X-Men Days of Future Past, consciousness-based time travel is possible in this universe. Rogue, Bobby Drake, Iceman, and Pyro, who's now been recast in this movie as Aaron Stanford, tangle with some teens in the food court. Pyro holds a personalized lighter emblazoned with a shark design, which apparently is an homage to Jaws, which Brian Singer said was his favorite movie, Charles freezes everyone before the situation gets out of hand, but leaves the mutants able to move. This just shows how Charles can, in an instant with just his mind, separate all mutants and humans with just his mental powers. Many of the extras in the scene were actually played by mimes because they were just so good at holding still. I want to imagine that one guy in the Oval Office later who just freezes with a pen in his mouth, that guy's got to be a mime, right? Okay, a newscast details Nightcrawler's attack at the White House, and right under the TV is a sign that says smoking is not permitted in the museum, which makes those guys ask for a light from Pyro extra assholey. So back at the Academy, they discuss the White House attack, Jean sits across from the chessboard from Charles and she toys with the with her heightened Phoenix powers in this movie. She is arguably on par with Charles and the next film will be a conflict between the X-Men and Phoenix. We are introduced to Colonel Stryker played by Brian Cox of succession fame and a number of other roles. So Stryker is adapted from Reverend Stryker in the comics who is a religious fanatic and televangelist that writer Chris Claremont based on Jerry Falwell. Stryker in this movie is accompanied by Yuriko Oyama, Lady Deathstrike played by Kelly Hu, who has exactly one one line of dialogue in this entire film. She cracks her knuckles with these unsettling, loud, almost mechanical cracking noises, a hint at her adamantium skeleton. I find it interesting though that Stryker refuses the drink from the president, maybe from that dark past with his son Jason, caused his wife to take a drill to her head. The guy just doesn't want to be inebriated in any state because, you know, he's inebriating every mutant he can get his hands on. President McKenna brings in Senator Kelly, who's actually Mystique in disguise, as we learned from the end of the first film. And while this movie doesn't address it, has Mystique been going around as Senator Kelly full time? Is she making all all of his appointments, votes, hearings, fundraisers, campaign events? How does she have all this time? Stryker drops some satellite photos of the jet at Xavier's school. This facility is a school. Sure it is. Ah, this movie came out in 2003 after Secretary of State Colin Powell went before the UN with satellite imagery of the facilities he claimed were building WMDs in Iraq, which the Bush administration, of course, used as justification to invade the country. If you're old enough, you remember watching the news where it was often debated whether an aerial shot of something was a school or a combatant training camp. Stryker says, I was piloting black ops missions in the jungles of North Vietnam where you were sucking on your mama's tit at Woodstock, Kelly. But actually, in X-Men Days of Future Past, alternate timeline versions of Mystique and Stryker do run into each other and fight in Vietnam. So Bobby tries to kiss Rogue, and Peter Rasputin Colossus draws a doodle making fun of them. We saw Peter sketching by the pond in the first film. Logan returns, and he gets frosty greetings from both Bobby and Scott. It's this classic dynamic when the bad boy comes back to visit, all the nice guys just start growling. In his plastic prison, Eric Lyncher listens to Mozart's Serenade Number no. 13 in G Major as he reads T.H. White's The Once and Future King. This is about the legend of King Arthur as a figure who will one day return to continue ruling as King of Britain. This is called back at the end of the film. Have any of you read a book by an English novelist named T.H. White called Once in Future King? Eric's book is a worn out first edition copy of the collection, which was published in 1958. But remember, in the years since X-Men 2000, Ian McKellen had appeared as Gandalf in Fellowship and in Two Towers, and would later this year in 2003 appear in Return of the King. So seeing him reading The Once and Future King just carried a deeper layer of meaning for all the nerds high-fiving in the theater, of which I was one of them. In addition to the metal-free chess set from the first film's final scene, we see that Charles sleeps on a mattress that's essentially an inflatable pool raft. His jumpsuit, though, is numbered 0001, as Eric is the first and likely only 
mutant in this facility. And Eric, as someone particularly triggered by humans being tagged with numbers, he must feel especially stung to be the first number in whatever this new wave of genocide is going to be. Charles shows Wolverine's Cerebro with non-mutated humans represented in white and mutants represented in red. Like a chessboard, there are two sides, two colors. On this world map, there's a particularly bright spot in the Washington, D.C. area that would be around where Magneto is being kept. Mystique transforms from Senator Kelly to Eureka back into herself to access Stryker's computer in the most Easter egg packed scene of the movie. There are tons of important names on this thing, a few being characters that we will see later in this franchise or later in the MCU. On the drop down menu, we see John Allardyce, that's Pyro, Amara Aquila, that's Magma, Allison Blair, that's Dazzler, Sally Blevins, Skids, Elizabeth Braddock, Psylocke, Maria Castellanos, that's Feral, Cassidy 2 refers to Sean Cassidy, Banshee, and Teresa, Siren, Lila Cheney, associate of the X Men and the New Mutants, Victor Creed, Sabretooth, Roberto da Costa, that's Sunspot, Lorna Dane, that's Polaris, Bobby Drake, Iceman, Fred Dukes, Blob, we'll meet him in X Men Origins, Angelo Espinosa, Skin, Kyle Gibney, Wild Child, Guthrie 2 refers to Paige Guthrie, Husk, and Sam Guthrie, Cannonball, Kinyucho Harada, that's Silver Samurai, we'll see them in The Wolverine, Garrison Kane, that's Weapon X from X Force, a version of them was going to be in the original draft of Deadpool, Remy LeBeau, Gambit, Eric Lynch or Magneto, Artie Maddox is that Fork Tongue Kid from the museum earlier, Jamie Madrox is Multiple Man, Jian Koi Man is Karma, Maximoff 2 refers to, of course, the mutants, Wanda Maximoff, Scarlet Witch, and Pietro Maximoff, Quicksilver, and we had two different versions of Quicksilver, the Evan Peters one in the X-Men films, and then the Aaron Taylor Johnson version in the MCU. Kevin McTaggart likely refers to Proteus, son of Moira McTaggart, and Daniel Moonstar Mirage, who shows up in New Mutants and Aurora Monroe Storm. And then a few seconds later on the other screen, many of these names reappear along with new folders with new names, including Root Bat Seref, that's Sabra, Cecilia Reyes, the mutant doctor in the New Mutants, Everett Thomas, Sink, Nicole and Claudette St. Croix, those are the psychic twins, Kurt Wagner, Nightcrawler, Raven Darkhold, Mystique, Vanessa Carlisle, Copycat, Wade Wilson, Deadpool, his first Marvel movie cameo, Scott Summer, Cyclops, Doug Ramsey, Cypher, Andrea and Andreas Von Strucker, those are the twins who become Fenris, Yuriko Oyama, so I guess Stryker's got a file for her too, Tom Cassidy, aka Black Tom Cassidy, we see a version of him in Deadpool 2, David North, aka Maverick and Agent Smith, Tabitha Smith, Boom Boom, Calvin Rankin, Mimic, Dr. Nathaniel Essex, Mr. Sinister, who was set up in the post credit scene of X-Men Apocalypse, and rumor has it might be a major villain when the X-Men come into the MCU. Mortimer Toyney B. Toad, Ileana Rasputin Magic, who's played by Anya Taylor-Joy in New Mutants, Teresa Rourke, again, is Teresa Rourke Cassidy Siren, Shiro Yoshida Sunfire, Guido Carousella Strong Guy, Catherine Kitty Pride Shadow Cat, and Dr. Carl Lycos Sauron. Now, other folders are labeled Omega Red, that refers to an X-Men villain, Xavier School, you know what that is, Blackbird, you know what that is, Massachusetts Academy refers to the new site of Xavier's school in the comics. Trask, that's Boulevard Trask, creator of the Sentinels. We see him played by Peter Dinklage in Days of Future Past. Gray Malkin refers to Jonas Gray Malkin, a mutant whose strength depends on light exposure. Zero Tolerance refers to an X-Men comic storyline. Project Wide Awake is part of the Sentinel creation operation. So we see Alpha Flight, Beta Flight, and Gamma Flight in different spots. Those refer to Canadian mutant teams. Department H is what oversees those teams. Jamie Braddock is Psylocke's older brother who can manipulate reality. Danger Room, we know what that is. Is. That's the training room of the X-Men and where we talk about spoilers. Forge is a tech-savvy weapons expert. Brotherhood, that's the name of Magneto's crew. Weapon X, obviously, Striker's operation. Rain St. Clair is Wolfsbane. That's one of the New Mutants who's played by Maisie Williams in the New Mutants film. Cerebro, know what that is. Legacy is a virus that was released by Strife against the mutants. Salem Center is also another name for Xavier's Academy. Franklin Richards, this is the son of Reed Richards and Sue Storm, who is defined as an Omega-level mutant. And when John Krasinski, Reed Richards, referred to the fact that he had kids, technically, Franklin Richards exists in MCU continuity somewhere. Mirror Island refers to the research center created by Moira McTaggart. Rose Byrne plays her in first class, and that's supposed to be Moira in the post credit scene of The Last Stand. Morlocks is the underground mutant group. Kevin McTaggart is Moira's son, aka Proteus. Thank you to BetterHelp for sponsoring this video. A new year is a great excuse for finally tackling the stuff that you put off last year. And if one of the things you've been putting off until 2024 is taking proper care of your mental health, BetterHelp can help you get started. And hey, no judgment for waiting. Starting therapy can be hard, and the right therapist for you might not be in your area, and some people struggle with the face-to-face -face interaction of therapy. With BetterHelp, you can have your therapy sessions as a phone call, as a video chat, or even via messaging if you prefer that. Whatever is the most comfortable version of therapy for you. Just click the link in the description and answer a few questions about what you're looking for from therapy and what your preferences are. BetterHelp will then match you with the therapist from their network that's right for you. If you don't really fit with that therapist, which is a common thing with therapy, you can easily switch to a therapist for no additional cost without stressing about insurance, who is in your network, or anything like that. If you think you might benefit from therapy, consider BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit BetterHelp.com 
betterhelp.com slash new rockstars. Clicking that link helps support this channel and also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp so you can connect with a therapist to see if it helps you. They also stuck in some crew names on the guard IDs. We see Tom DeSanto, the executive producer who helped write the first film script, as well as Michael Dougherty and Dan Harris. They are co-writers. One of the names is L. Donner, referring to Lauren Schuler Donner, the executive producer. There's also a photo director, Brian Singer, who also shows up wheeling Charles in to visit Eric. Now, outside the church where Nightcrawler's hiding, graffiti reads, nature lasts last, which is a slight alteration on the comment saying, nature always has a last laugh, detailing the law of entropy, which states that everything in nature, every system will increase in disorder and chaos. Basically, man plans, God laughs, or a reflection of how, despite humans' efforts to stamp out mutants, natural selection will find a way. When Gene and Storm enter this church, Kurt yells at them in German. Is he out? Are you bored yet? which translated means, get out. I am a minion of the devil. I am a spawn of evil. In the comics, Kurt is deeply religious and even studied to be a priest at one point while he was still in the X-Men. As Gene tends to his wounds, Nightcrawler gestures to Jesus Christ. Perhaps he is testing me. In 2022's Immortal X-Men number one, the character Exodus actually implies that Jesus was a mutant. Wolverine dreams of Alkali Lake and the champagne glasses return, but now they add more images. Stryker snapping his dog tag in half, which is what they do to a soldier who's KIA, but notice at the end of this movie, Logan will leave Stryker with the second half of that dog tag. Wolverine meets this mutant kid, Jones, who's blinking to change channels. Most of the channels are reporting on the White House attack, but there is this one. Science Museum are claiming to have experienced. Yeah, this is a report of Charles freezing everyone at the Science Museum the day before, because yeah, everyone at that museum would be pretty freaked out. Charles and Eric recall Colonel Stryker's son, Jason. Fortunately, I wasn't able to help him. At least not in the way that his father wanted. As all of these movies depict mutation as a metaphor for the gay rights movement, this suggests that Stryker hoped that Charles Xavier's facility would be a form of conversion therapy. And we see this mutant LGBT parallel mostly with the character of Bobby Drake in this film, who tells Logan that his parents think that this is a prep school. Bobby dates Rogue in these films, but in the comics, Bobby Drake was famously confirmed to be gay in 2015. The nature documentary that Jones is watching actually mimics exactly what happens in this movie. Sensing danger, the mother rat races home. The babies can't even see the killer. And someone uninvited is coming to dinner. She arrives too late for one baby. Now Jones gets hit with some darts, but don't worry, he reappears in X-Men The Last Stand. But this attack on the school is an A-plus sequence that emphasizes this movie's themes of fear of the other. Because after empathetically relating to the fear of the humans in the opening, now we're afraid of how fear would turn government forces into people who raid a school of children. Wolverine is the best babysitter. It's so satisfying to see him go full berserker. You picked the wrong house, Bob. <laughs> Shoot me, shoot me! But they actually removed a few extra seconds of footage from after Wolverine stabs a soldier in the kitchen for MPAA ratings. A longer, more violent version of this is in the special edition. Now, Jackman was obviously great in the first X-Men movie, but in X2 is when he starts going full rage mode for any of these action sequences, screaming himself hoarse and taking us to the gun show. The series takes really a turn here, transforming Wolverine into a parental figure, setting him up for the lone wolf and cub relationship that he'll have with X-23 and Logan. Kitty Pride, played by Katie Stewart before the character was recast as Elliot page in The Last Stand, phases through the bed and the walls. Siren, played by Shauna Kane, wakes up and sounds the alarm across the school. Colossus, who appeared earlier in the movie, played by Daniel Cudmore, meddles up. Stryker hints at his and Wolverine's shared past, but Bobby forms an ice wall between Logan and Stryker. Like the opening sequence, Logan is being iced out of his past. This ice wall is actually a practical effect and weighed 3,500 pounds. When Wolverine and the kids use Cyclops' car, they get into a Mazda RX-8 concept that was made just for the movie. Kind of like the Dr. Pepper product placement earlier, Mazda was another time and sponsor for the film. The blue paint is a special tint that Mazda called Mutant Blue and the X in the RX-8. The back was also enlarged to emphasize the movie's branding. But in this car, Pyro tries to break the silence with music and accidentally plays NSYNC's Bye 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 on full blast. Brian Singer was apparently friends with NSYNC member JC Chazé, even as late as X-Men Apocalypse in 2016. Come on, Chazé. Everyone knew who Brian was at that point. As Wolverine speeds down the road, notice there are no headlights. Now, I get it, it's to avoid detection, but you know, this is not safe, Logan. You're more likely to get pulled over by a patrol car. In the bar on the TV is Dr. Hank McCoy, aka Beast, played by actor Steve Backick, before Kelsey Grammer played him in The Last Stand. Also on the show is the mention of a Mr. Shaw, which is a nod to Sebastian Shaw, the leader of the Hellfire Club, who Kevin Bacon plays in X-Men First Class. The newscaster hosting the debate is actually a cameo by David Kay, voice of Professor X in X-Men Evolution. Oh. 
Let's see if I can get Apocalypse's attention. But this bar bathroom set where Mystique hooks up with the guard was actually built for the first movie for a flashback to the onset of Scott's powers and his accidental destroying of his high school bathroom. That scene was recreated in X-Men Apocalypse with Ty Sheridan. Rebecca Romaine gets to play without makeup for this scene, but she does wear this tight blue dress to hint at Raven's natural skin. Stryker confronts Charles over the tragedy of his son, Jason, whom he introduces in this movie as Mutant 143. This version of Jason Stryker is based on Jason Wingard, aka the Mutant Mastermind. And starting in 2013, the character was reintroduced in all new X-Men number 19 as Jason Stryker, William Stryker's son. At Bobby's house, we see several snow-themed posters on the wall of his bedroom, snowboarding, skiing, as this kid probably would have enjoyed snow sports where he could have tested out his powers without people noticing as much. Wolverine draws his claws on the cat, who purrs and licks the claws, but listen closely. Yeah, did Wolverine hurt that cat when he retracted his claws? I hope we just scared it, because we do see the cat get picked up later. I think the cat's okay. I think the mark of a great action movie is if it has had at least three great sequences, and Magneto's prison break is one of them in this one. Eric listens to Mozart and notices something different about Lorio. No. No, it's not that. From the close-up of Eric's smile to his slow rise with the shadows under his eyes this time, hiding his bruises, it's all storyboarded like a great comic page. Charles lifts Lorio. Too much iron in your blood. And he sucks the molten metal that Mystique injected into his blood. It's so sick. This power status shift, it's totally an homage to Hannibal Lecter's escape in The Silence of the Lambs, where the white-dressed elderly supervillain overpowers the guards in a bloody display. For what it's worth, Brian Cox actually played Hannibal before Anthony Hopkins in the very first Hannibal movie, Manhunter. We're reminded of Eric's single fired bullet in the first film, and with just a few ounces of metal, he now obliterates the glass cell and flattens one into a disc to fly upon. I'm pretty sure it's still stained with traces of blood of Lorio when he steps on it. One detail I always love is the look of glee on Ian McKellen's face as he floats toward the guard booth and unleashes those metal orbs on them. So in the scene, Bobby comes out to his family. Ian McKellen, who is gay, reportedly worked with the writers to help make the scene feel authentic. Bobby's mother says this is her fault, but John says that males carry the mutant gene, which is interesting biologically, as a Y chromosome is far smaller than the X chromosome and typically doesn't carry many genetic traits, if any. But in a way, this shifts the responsibility, so to speak, on William Stryker for his son, Jason. And to underline this coming out parallel, Bobby's mom later asks him, Have you tried? not being a mutant. But Bobby's shitty brother calls the Boston PD. I love how all these cops make sure to have their Boston accents. And John sprays them with fire. Rogue absorbs his power to reduce the flames. Jason Stryker, meanwhile, projects an illusion in Charles's mind of a time when they were at the X-Mansion together. At first, Charles is shown standing like how he stood when he projected himself in Senator Kelly's memory in the first film. And when he walks around in Wanda Maximoff's mind in Multiverse of Madness, it's just a simple way to show the audience when we are inside of a mind versus reality. But notice how Jason cleverly keeps Charles in the wheelchair for the second time he goes into his mind, which makes it hard for Charles to know what's reality and what's illusion. The Blackbird is approached by two fighter jets, and the one who signals them is Captain Raygun Lai, a reference to Ray Raygun Lai, a comic artist and concept artist, credited graphic designer for this X2 film. Ray was also a concept artist for the 2003 Battlestar Galactica miniseries, and in the 2008 Battlestar Galactica, there is a similar Easter egg on a jet. Storm tries to fend off the pilots with tornadoes, but fails to stave off the last two missiles. Jean awakens her Phoenix Force powers, destroying one of the missiles but fails to stop the second. Rogue gets sucked out of the jet, but Nightcrawler teleports to catch her without waiting for anyone to direct him. I love Nightcrawler in this movie. Magneto catches the whole jet though. When will these people learn how to fly? Which is a meta joke referring to the fact that in the X-Men comics and TV shows, some of these X-Men just use their powers to fly. Like everyone can fly. Technically Magneto though does not fly in these movies. He just lifts his body with magnetic forces. But they really go to efforts in this movie to make sure that Storm does not fly. She just kind of like levitates by wind. Magneto tells Wolverine that Stryker was the source of his adamantium on his bones, and Logan says that they already searched the Alkali Lake compound, but Magneto responds, Once again, you think it's all about you. Calling back Eric's catty line to Logan on the train. But really, all of these X-Men movies are like about Wolverine. They should just call it the Wolverine franchise. Wolverine and Jean share a kiss since Scott is out of the picture. Now, Cyclops is the leader of the X-Men in the animated series and in most of the comics, but he unfortunately gets sidelined for most of these movies, presumably because his optic blast was a costly visual effect in the early aughts. Nowadays, notice how glowing energy blasts are like the cheapest visual effect. 80% of MCU characters' powers are just like blasting light from different parts of their bodies. Mystique enters Wolverine's tent as Jean, but Logan finds his scars he left on her stomach in Liberty Island, making us wonder if Mystique isn't able to shapeshift over certain scar tissue, or maybe if she just wanted Wolverine to find these marks to mess with them. No one's ever left a scar quite like you. In another subtle nod to Hannibal Lecter, Magneto catcalls Rogue. We love what you've done with your hair. It's similar to one of my favorite moments in The Silence of the Lambs. Oh, and Senator, just one more thing. Love your suit. Magneto meets Pyro. What's your real name, John? 
I appreciate the cult orthodoxy of Magneto. He understands that the real battle is recruiting from the younger generation. This gives a dual purpose to the superhero monikers of these films. It's really a way for these mutants to reclaim their identities. Pyro says, I can only manipulate the fire. I can't create it. You are a god among insects. Yeah, there's definitely a parallel to Prometheus here from Greek mythology, the Titan who stole fire from the gods. Now they send in Wolverine, actually Mystique posing as him, but Stryker is not fooled. The one thing I know better than anyone is my own work. Seal the room, shoot it. How does Stryker see through this impersonation from across the room? It's not the appearance, it's the emotion. Because Stryker knows that Wolverine would look at him and at all this facility with rage in his eyes. Because remember earlier, you wanna shoot me, shoot me! That is the true Wolverine. A Wolverine this calm would totally be a red flag to Stryker. And remember, Stryker's computer had a file on Raven Mystique, so he's completely prepared for a metamorph trying to infiltrate anything he has. I just love it when villains are smart. We also gotta give props to Stryker for his plan here, tricking Charles into thinking he's in his home cerebro when he's really in a false duplicate that Stryker had constructed. It's like the con used by the crew in Ocean's Eleven when he can't break into a vault, build your own replica vault, and lure in the mark to help you break into his own vault. Mystique flips him off with a backward slide, a move that she learned from Logan in the first film, and she morphs into Stryker immediately. It happens so fast. And props to Brian Cox for doing his own little moves here. We have a metamorph loose. Could be anybody. What? I love it when other actors impersonate what Mystique would do as them in these movies. So the X-Men rejoin Mystique and Magneto. A large portion of energy from the dam has been diverted to this chamber. Cerebro. There it is. Yeah, you can hear the call to opportunity in Eric's voice because his plan is to take control of Cerebro and twist it for his own agenda. And again, we're just seeing smart villains making smart choices. Yet, Jean is onto them. She doesn't want to leave them alone. Stryker whispers in Jason's ear to make Charles link with all the mutants to kill them. Charles's earlier warning to Logan to make him think he was a little girl now seems ironic. It's the illusion of a little girl that fools Charles. Yet, we should note that Jason Stryker projects himself as a different gender, which adds a deeper layer of tragedy for the character as they were misunderstood by their father. Nightcrawler and Storm find the detained mutant kids, and seconds before Kurt teleports into the chamber, if you brighten the shot of the kids looking up at him, you can see Alan coming in the background. They used a shot of the actor before he stepped forward out of the shadows, and you can really only see this if you have like an OLED screen at home with the brightness settings way upped. Wolverine finds the Weapon X lab with X-ray scans that we saw flashes of earlier, but now we see them more closely, including ones of him as well as Deathstrike's hand, but there are a few other possible test subjects from over the years. The skull with spikes, that could belong to Quill, and then the shoulder wing, that could belong to Angel, both of these characters we meet in the last stand. Wolverine finds the molten adamantium and the hose is used in his surgery and he flashes back again to one of his memories. One of the military officers has this patch of a black horse on a red and white field. This is for the U.S. Army's 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment. Worth noting that canonically to the Marvel Comics, Wolverine's past with Weapon X was the U.S. government's attempt to recreate the super soldier success that they had with Steve Rogers during World War II with adamantium being a synthetic alloy of vibranium. Stryker says that the reason this lab is still set up this way is that they cannot ever let adamantium cool, making it, in a way, a kind of eternal flame or an evil fountain of youth forever bubbling for certain rapid healing victims of the military industrial complex. Deathstrike was yet another of these test subjects, but as Stryker leaves, he passes morgue corpse drawers, suggesting dozens of others might have died. When Deathstrike extends her claws, we can see that they are segmented as if each segment was stacked inside of the other, you know, like a, a lightsaber toys. That would really be the only way these claws could fit into her phalanges. Actress Kelly Hu had real prop adamantium nails, which were glued to the bottom of her fingernails. Ugh. This fight is brutal, and Wolverine ends it by plugging her with more adamantium. In this movie, plugging people with molten metal. Two crazy, gnarly deaths <laughs> using the same kind of close-up. In the last second, you can actually see Stryker's brainwash serum fading from her eyes as she looks with lucid awareness at Logan and the adamantium leaks from her eyes like tears. It's just a striking reminder to Logan that these mutants are not each other's enemies. It's the government forces that did this to them. Jason and Charles link with all the mutants. Deleted scenes would have shown other mutants, including the Hank McCoy we saw earlier transforming into his beast form, Gambit, Remy LeBeau, playing cards and his energy flaring up. Actually, this kind of psionic seizure from Charles Xavier is the dark fate that awaits most of the X-Men in the years leading up to the events of Logan. Magneto pulls the pins out of all the soldiers' grenades. Whoa, boom, and he opens a Cerebro chamber. Since Eric helped Charles build Cerebro, he knows what tiles to reconfigure, and Mystique impersonates Stryker to flip Cerebro to target humans instead. Throughout this film, Nightcrawler has needed to see his destination before he bamps into it. That's why, actually, there was that creepy shot of him peeking through the doorway in the White House earlier, and he needed all the doors to be open before he entered them. But Storm uses their exchange about blind faith to get him to teleport into the Cerebro chamber. The bamf occurs precisely on the part of the Lord's Prayer as it is in heaven. As it is in heaven. 
As far as Kurt knew, this moment of transfer could have taken him directly to his death. And anytime he transfers, he is going through the brimstone dimension to get there. So he's kind of praying, in this moment, take me through hell, but take me to heaven on the other side of it, please. And there, Storm lowers the temperature to get Jason drop his projection, and they leave poor Jason Stryker there to die, even though he was being chemically brainwashed by his father to do what he did. Sacrifices on both sides. The dam breaks, and Jean Grey exits the Blackbird to stop the floodwater. A little detail I just noticed, behind Scott and Logan, you can see Kurt shifting around, and then some pre-brimstone dimension smoke forming, as he is trying to teleport to save Jean, but she is stopping him. The Phoenix Force rises out of Jean, and again, it's just a bit of a bummer that Cyclops James Marsden is sidelined in this film, other than to mourn and Jean in this moment. Something the actor has to do from behind this bulky eyepiece. But I love that Logan is the one to hug Scott afterwards. Because this battle began with mankind's fear of mutants to extinguish it, they return to where it all began, inside of the White House Oval Office. As Charles interrupts President McKenna's address, the mutants appear suddenly among McKenna's advisors, faster even the Nightcrawler could teleport, making me think that Charles even made the president black out for an additional second. They present some paperwork from Stryker's office to prove his wrongdoing, and Charles says that he knows a girl who can walk through walls, of course referencing Kitty Pride, but this is also a veiled threat to the president, that that mystery mutant from Illinois that Senator Kelly ranted about is yet another mutant beside Nightcrawler who can get to him. But the symbolism is important here. Charles positions all these mutants so that they are standing among the humans in the room. He wants to pose a united front to the president to give him a glimpse at a possible future where a president's inner advisors can include both humans and mutants, and both sides can be at the levers of power. Because mutants and humans are not on opposite sides of the chessboard, they are really in this together. The previous film ended with a chess match, and Charles alludes to another match here. The next move is yours. Back at the school, Charles senses Jean's presence outside the window, looks directly into the camera, because Jean is still alive in the form of the Phoenix Force. He begins his lecture involving T.H. White's The Once and Future King, showing that he and Eric are still part of that book club. Whereas Charles normally takes us in and out of these movies, now Jean's voice takes over, quoting Charles' opening words from the first movie as the silhouette of a phoenix appears beneath the water. But every few hundred millennia, evolution leaps forward and we will pick up with Phoenix's future in next week's breakdown of The Last Stand. But quickly, some Deadpool 3 spoilers in the danger room, if you're curious. Succession actor Brian Cox being in this film reminds us that the Tom Wamsgans to his Logan Roy, Matthew McFadden, is playing some role in Deadpool 3. Online rumors claimed a TVA agent named Paradox, but apparently that claimant said that they made that up to fool other scoopers, so who knows? Okay, the best way to support new rock stars is to grab some X-Men-inspired merch at nerdriot.shop. Follow me on all social platforms at EAVoss and subscribe to all three channels in the New Rockstars Network. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next week. Six, six. Bye.